in lieu of surgery. Now that is not the kind of study that gives you a clean answer. But it enabled the study to be done and is argue and what they found was surgery offered no advantage over this sort of smorgasbord of, of alternative non-surgical therapies. Arguably, so there's actually a lot of controversy about the study, but it was an attempt to make the study broadly generalizable because this is what physicians actually do. This is what they actually do, and it involved, you know, the control group involved quite a range of conservative therapies, but, you know, nothing was shown, uh, surgery was not shown to be superior to that melange. So that's an example of what might be a more generalizable uh, uh, experiment and would not be exactly the same as uh, maybe a more pristine experiment run with a particular alternative non-surgical care, which a lot of people might reject because they say, well, I, never, I would never tell my patient to use that form of physical therapy. I use this form of physical therapy. And so that would be rejected by them, and they might be right. But in this case, they use them all. So I don't, I don't know how better to answer the, the question, but, but that's how I'd answer it. Other comments or questions? Yeah, from the back. You might have to yell. Yes. Right. Right, we can't get to the absolute, we can sometimes come very, very, very close, but we can never run the same person through the same mill at the same time and observe the outcome under the alternative conditions, yeah. 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 I think that comes very, very close to your ideal experiment. And of course, you can sort of do that in medicine too when you're working on eyes, when you're working. Right, it depends on what the kind of intervention is. But so you're right, if you, if you treat one side, you treat the other side, you can tell yourself a very convincing story, and it's probably right, that the sidedness didn't make a difference, that people don't favor, I don't know, uh, to what extent the right side, you know, people might uh, on average, you know, have different pressures or, or chew more on one side or the other. You're still making a leap that, that literally the left side is the same as the right side, uh, and that these other things that I'm just making up here don't make a difference. But the leap is a very, very tiny one. So I agree with you that in, in those situations where you have designs that you're comparing left versus right, you've pretty, you're coming very, very close to an ideal, uh, you know, almost like a physics experiment where, where each side is subjected to the same conditions. So. I don't know enough about dentistry to know when right might not be equal to left, but you're coming awfully close. Yeah. But it's, I, I still want to say it's not exactly the same. It's not the same as doing it on the right side, you know, uh, to that same tooth under its same conditions. So it's not precisely the same, but, so, but the gap is really, really small. Yeah. As people didn't think of it before. Um, that's the problem, but even if we're following them forward, we can only follow them for the things that we think of today. But, but that's the same thing as saying that the records may not have exactly what you are now interested in. So the data in, in the past is not complete. So that, that, that is a good one. So let's go to case control designs. This is the most widely misunderstood study design, and um, very often, people don't even know that they did a case control study or they didn't do one and they call it a case control study. And it's not their fault. Case control studies have a terrible, terrible name. Um, and the name has very little to do with what its logic is. 
So the, the case control study is that two groups of people are differentiated on the basis of their outcome, on the basis of the effect, and then investigated to find out what was different about what gave them that effect. That is, you, you see whether people had good outcomes, whether they had bad outcomes, and then you go back and see what treatments they had. So you're going back in causal time. You're going back in causal direction. So you look at the outcome, which happens after the intervention, and then you go backwards and you find, for example, how many people had uh, you know, a given anesthetic or a, different, uh, a, a given treatment. So it's retrospective by definition in that you know what happened. You start with the later event and you go backwards in time to find out uh, what, what treatment they had. Now there actually are ways, if data was gathered prospectively, you can get that information and sort of reconstruct a case control study. Um, so that's what's called, a, sometimes called a case cohort study, but it's the same logic. And finally, there are these uh, cross-sectional studies, which is that the outcome and the risk factor are measured at the same time. And this often happens when they're measuring blood levels or something, or, and, and they're looking at the difference between people who had different outcomes, and everything is measured at the same time. So it's not clear what caused what. So this word retrospective is very, very confusing because it's critical to distinguish between temporal direction, that is, are you going backwards in time to get information and records, uh, or causal direction, are you going from the outcome and you're going back to the cause. There's not a unique meaning of retrospective. It's used both ways. And as I said before, the best use is when we gather information uh, that was recorded in the past. So I'm not going to go through all this. Now the very, very final thing I'm going to talk about before we go into our dental examples is how to ask a, a, an actually precise question. How to look at the question that they posed in the research. And this is very widely ignored. And I'm going to start with a sort of racy example, but it was published in JAMA. So, you know, put a little thrill into the proceedings. And uh, this was an exploration of how people answered the question, the rather, it turns out, vague question about uh, whether they had had sex. And this is highly relevant to STD prevention and uh, all sorts of other uh, uh, health uh, and sex related surveys and this actually this is a very famous article I don't know how many of you know do, do any of you know why this is so famous when this occurred when this appeared so let me let me give you a clue so I think I heard it you you, you said it Monica Lewinsky yes this appeared in 1999 right at the height of the Clinton impeachment imbroglio and uh, not only did it appear at a particularly sensitive time but it uh, got the editor of JAMA fired George Lundberg because the AMA felt that he was dabbling in politics but it still was vaguely interesting from a methodologic view so here it was they they actually explored what it was that college students interpreted this question of whether they had had sex. And I won't read through the outcomes, you can, and these are the percentage of, of folks who just kissing would, was enough to say they quote unquote had sex. Here are other levels of uh, sexual intimacy. But actually the most interesting thing I, I think is down here you have intercourse. What, who are the 0.3% of women and 0.8% of men who do not consider this to be sex? So <laughs> this is interesting. But it just shows that you have to have an extremely well-formulated question to get unambiguous answers. And this is true of research as well. So uh, with that as background, let's talk quickly about what are the characteristics of a well-formulated research question. And it's not that simple. So first of all, it has to be focused. It has to be well-defined, it has to be relevant, and it has to be answerable. But it has particular components that make it all of these things. So I wish I had dental examples here, but we'll, we'll do this when we go to the example. So here's an example. Treatment of atrial fibrillation. So we're going to explore the, you know, the effects of the treatment of a a AFib. The question is, what kind of treatment? Can be drugs? Could be paddles, 
Which ones? What kind of AFib? Is it chronic? Is it new? Is it relapsed? Is it recurrent? All of these things will have, you know, are related to the patient in front of you and, and related to the scientific question. What's the comparison? Are you comparing it to nothing? Are you comparing it to paddles if you're using drugs or drugs if you're using paddles? Older drugs, newer drugs? In whom? After surgery, people with heart disease, new onset, they've had it for a certain period of time. So you see that this, what seems like a simple question, is actually a very complex question. So, and finally, the outcome. Is it just whether you can get them back to a normal rhythm? If so, for a week, for a month, for a year? Is it, do they go into the hospital? Is it if they have relapse? Et cetera, et cetera. So a focused clinical question has to have six parts, and it's the same as what's often uh, talked about in the, the, the PICO uh, format for a medical record. You have to define the patient or the population and the condition, so that's the P part. Then you have to define the intervention. Then you have to define the comparison. Then you have to define the outcome, the timing, that is over what period of time, and the setting in which this is being done. All of these have to be defined to be a good research question. And to the extent that these are fuzzy, you're going to get fuzzy answers. And when you look at papers, often these six components are not clearly there. They may have been there in how they did the study, but they don't tell you. So you don't know how to weigh them. Or they weren't there even when they did the study. So, well, here's an example in heart failure of defining the condition. Heart failure can be defined in many, many ways in terms of left ventricular function, in terms of chest x-ray findings, in terms of just the, the clinician's diagnosis, in terms of symptoms, shortness of breath, or functional status. What can they do during the day? All of those can be definitions of heart failure. And this gets to this issue of how does it apply to you in practice? Which of these are going to be the things that you are dealing with in practice? You, you may not be able to measure left ventricular function. Maybe that all the studies are done defining left ventricular function. But you can typically ask about functional status or symptoms. So a study that uses the symptoms or functional status to determine who's in that study is going to be far more relevant to you than something that does a laboratory measurement that you would only do on in, in, in ex extraordinary cases. So patient comes to you, they have pain, they have difficulty chewing, they have difficulty swallowing, who knows? You know, that's what you know. And a study that studies those kinds of patients might be most relevant to, to you. Defining the condition, there are all sorts of different levels of rigor. Defining the population, you have the setting, you have the demographics, you have the comorbidities. Uh, defining the intervention. The interventions typically have timing, intensity, frequency, duration. Any one of the therapies that you use are, can be infinitely variable. Whether it's a laser, or an antibiotic treatment. So I'm not going to go through all of these. Let's look at a few uh, uh, clinical uh, questions. Again, these are not uh, dental examples, but you can perhaps give them to me. Uh, patient or problem in elderly patients, and you'd have to define what elderly meant, greater than 65. With new onset atrial fibrillation, the intervention would electrocardioversion uh, three. Uh, when compared with rate control alone or chemical cardioversion uh, and outcomes, timing, and setting lead to six-month uh, outpatient, uh, lead to lower six-month patient outpatient mortality, is this enough to be worth the increased risk or cost? So that is a structured clinical question. And that's something that you can answer in a study, in theory. Here's another one. Uh, in patients, adult patients with heart failure who are in normal sinus rhythm, would adding anticoagulation with warfarin to standard therapy, when compared with standard therapy, lead to more, lower mor morbidity or mortality from uh, thrombosis, thromboembolism? Is this enough to be worth the increased risk of bleeding? So here you have the weighing of benefit and harm. And uh, this just shows how this can be done in. Uh, the etiology, etiologic questions, whether coffee causes coronary heart disease, diagnosis, whether you can uh, accurately uh, diagnose something in a particular context with a particular modality, 
uh, therapy, prognosis, and prevention. This sort of structure can apply to any of these questions. So now is our little quiz. And uh, I'll start with a few sort of pseudo-hypothetical examples, then I'll show you a few examples from the dental literature, which I explored just in the last few days. So here we go. A study is done in a series of children living in high-risk environments are matched with counterparts living in low-risk environments, and subsequent caries rates are compared. This is an example of A, a controlled trial, B, a cohort study, a case control study, or a cross-sectional study. So think about it for a second. Okay. So how many vote for a controlled clinical trial? So the number of hands have to add up to the number of people in the room when I'm done. Dr. Nazari is doing the counting. CME credit depends. A cohort study? Okay. Case control study? Couple. Cross-sectional study? Interesting. Okay. So I would contend that it is a cohort study, but there is a context in which we could uh, call it a cross-sectional study. So why is it a cohort study? Well, first of all, what's the exposure? What's the intervention? It's living in a high-risk or low-risk environment. An experimental study would randomize a kid to live in the high-risk or low. So, but we haven't talked about, they just live there. So the risk factor is where they live, and that's determined by them, by the world, by their parents. So it's clearly not an experimental study. So it's some sort of observational study. So then it's probably cohort, case control, or cross-sectional. So what would make it a cross-sectional study? If the cohort study is, assumes that we have followed them in time in the low-risk environment and seen what their caries rates were, the cross-sectional study would be measuring these both at the same time. We took a snapshot of these kids living there today, and we looked at the caries rate. So in that sense, this could be described actually as a cross-sectional study because we're measuring them at the same time. We don't know if they move there today. So it could be cross-sectional if we, if, if we, if we um, measured where they lived and their caries at the same time, or it could be a cohort study is if we match these kids for where they were living a year ago or two years ago and then look to see if they develop caries. So I haven't given you enough information here. I called it a cohort study, but it is, or it could be in some, depending on exactly what was done, it could also be a cross-sectional study. And then in theory, you wouldn't know which caused what. Uh, so here's another one. A study of infectious disease causes of periodontitis is planned. Ten patients with periodontitis have cultures taken before and after taking a drug, as do ten normal volunteers. This trial design is, now I actually want, to think, want you to think about it, it's actually tricky. Um, is it a controlled clinical trial? Is it a cohort study? Is it a case control study? Or is it a cross-sectional study? Okay, so we have some with periodontitis. They have cultures taken before and after. They get uh, probably an antibiotic. And we have 10 normal volunteers with cultures taken before and after <coughs> the same drug. So who votes controlled clinical trial? OK, handful. Cohort study? Few. Case control study? Interesting, almost the same number. Cross-sectional study. Okay. This has two answers. <laughs> this is very, very tricky. So, and this is why you actually have to think hard about these designs. The, you know, if you say the word randomization, maybe it's obvious, but it's thinking about what's the effect and what's the outcome and what's the comparison it sometimes is, so what's different about these kids? What's different? No, not kids. It's uh, these. So the, the, what is the exposure that's different between the two groups? It's not the drug. 
Okay, both, to, both groups are getting the drug before and after, right? The difference is whether they had periodontitis or not. That's what's different between the groups. So the drug is sort of a feint here, okay? And then in some sense, you're, you're looking to see, in the, I, I would imagine, depending on what the drug is, whether the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the contamination or the, the bugs in, in the mouth were the same or changed as a function of the, of the, uh, the treatment. We didn't talk about a, uh, you know, a dental complication further on. And you're trying to see if the drug had a different effect in the periodontitis than it did in the normal kids. So in some sense, the drug, this before-after comparison is, is like a biomarker between the two. That is, you're, you're trying to see if, if the drug had a different effect in one than the other. So you, this, in a sense, biomarker, you're measuring the outcome at the same time that you measured their, their periodontal status. So it, it's as though I measured your blood pressure and then I me measured the blood pressure of somebody else. So the before after is just giving you one number. That is, it's just comparing between the two. It's sort of a controlled clinical trial in that you have given them this drug and you have looked at the outcome of both, um, but it's cross-sectional in the sense that, you've, that they have the condition, they don't have the condition, and then you're measuring this trait of their mouth. Uh, of, of, the, uh, of the microbiome in, the, in their mouth. So uh, the, the key thing here is to recognize what's different between the two groups. And the drug here is, in a sense, like a diagnostic test applied to both. It's simply to make a measurement, and you combine the before and after. You subtract them. So let's look at a uh, series of uh, articles from, from uh, journals that you might recognize. So let's start, actually, yeah, let's start with this one. Uh, lasers for treatment of dentin hypersensitivity, a meta-analysis. Now, I haven't actually talked about this as a design, but I, I brought this up here because it's sort of a meta-design. So a meta-analysis is actually an observational design. It's an observational design of studies. So even if it's a, if it's a, study of RCTs. It's an observational study of RCTs, which RCTs, the, in, instead of subjects, you're using studies as your subjects. And you have eligibility criteria, and you have uh, assessment criteria, just like you have in a regular study. So now what they do is they first, I just want to point out some of the elements here, and I'm sorry you can't read it. They have a uh, a tool for assessing the quality of the studies. And they have a seven-point tool which looks at sample size, randomization, uh, clear definition of inclusion, exclusion criteria, completeness of follow-up, whether groups are comparable, whether there's blinding, and whether there's appropriate statistical analysis. This is very, very crude, but um, it's, it's a start at at least describing, in a sense, what their patients are, which in this case are studies. And then they prevent, present sort of what's called an evidence table and here you have uh, uh, both the design, you have the mean age, not reported, not reported, 34, not reported, ranging from 20 to 52. Um, and then you have the number and the distribution of females to males. And then you have the actual intervention. And I don't know all these codes. These are different kinds of lasers and the number of wattage of the lasers and then the follow-up time. So what you see immediately, if you can see from anywhere, is that the kinds of lasers are different from study to study. EAG, and I'm sorry I can't uh, immediately uh, decode these. Uh, here we have the ND YAG laser and the e -Y? E -R YAG laser, um, the GAAIS, and each one has its own power uh, uh, characteristics. And the follow-up is different, one week, one month. 10, 1, 3, 6 months, 30 minutes, 2 weeks, 1 and 2 months, um, 1 week, 1 and 4 months, and adverse events, not reported in 4 of the 5, and uh, pain in the last one. So the, the reason these meta-analyses or systematic reviews as they're called have value is because they give you a picture of the literature in terms of design. You can see 
is there a body of literature that actually addresses the same question? And in many cases, what you find, and this is an extreme example maybe, is that the literature is so variable that there's no two studies that look at the same problem with the same intervention the same way. And if this is the case, it's impossible to get an accumulation of evidence in literature. That is, there's this fragmentation where everybody's addressing the question in a different way. The patients are different, the intervention's different, the outcome is different. All those things I said, each one of these studies is addressing essentially a different clinical question, even though it is nominally using, you know, lasers uh, um, for, treat for dentin hypersensitivity. So this is what can make it extremely difficult for a field to move forward if there's fragmentation of if there's multiple different questions, because one study never settles the question. Certainly not one observational study of eight patients. So I don't know how pervasive this is. I'm assuming it's pretty pervasive. Um, let's look at this in terms of uh, um, design. So actually, I'm going to have to read it to you, read it to myself. It's not that clear on this screen. So a comparison of teeth and implants during maintenance therapy in terms of number and disease free years and costs, an in vivo internal control study. So let's read the background. So I'll have to read it from here. It says, um, a ret this is a retrospective study carried out encompassing all patients who had initial periodontal treatment followed by implant placement and maintenance therapy in a specialist practice in Norway. The neighboring tooth and contralateral tooth were used as controls. The number of disease-free years and extra cross over and above maintenance therapy for both teeth and implants were recorded. Results, the sample consisted of 43 patients with an uh, average age of 67 years. Patients had 847 teeth at initial examination, received 119 implants. Two implants were removed 13 and 22 years after insertion. Um, <clears throat> the uh, prevalence of Pre peri implant uh, implantitis was 54% at the patient level, 31% implant level. Preve prevalence of periodontitis was 53% and 77.6% at the tooth level. Um, the mean number of disease free years were implants 8.7, neighboring tooth 9.08. Mean values were not statistically different. The extra cost of maintaining implants was five times higher for implants than for teeth. The conclusion, the number of disease-free years was the same for neighboring teeth and uh, contralateral teeth and implants. Um, however, due to the high prevalence of post-peri-implantitis, the cost of maintaining the implants was much higher than the cost of maintaining the teeth. So what is the design? So can somebody just describe the design, back to me. So retrospective. So in that sense, what they're doing is they're going back in time and they're looking at records. They didn't follow them forward. So the very first question I, I would ask about this is, you know, what do those records look like? You know, who maintains them? How complete was the survey? So it's, it's retrospective, but that just says when you got the data. Is it, it's observational, right? It's certainly observational. So what would make it, what would make it experimental? It would be, be experimental if they randomized which tooth was implanted, right? But you can't really do that. So it's observational, it's retrospective. So then the question, is it case control or is it cohort? The answer is it's cohort. They started with whether it was implanted or not, right? They took the implant and then they looked at the neighboring tooth. And then they followed forward to see what happened. That is in causal direction. This already happened in the past. But they started with the implant. They didn't start with the bad or good outcome at the end. So let me actually go jump to the next one and I'm going to ask you this. So look at the title. Gingival labial recessions and orthodontically treated and untreated individuals, a case control study. So you would think it would be a very easy question. What's the design of this study? You might say case control, 
Well, let's look at the abstract. So I'll have to read it to you. Material, objective. So this, this appeared, this is, all of these are from this month in these journals, by the way. So this is from June 2013, Journal of Clinical Periodontology. Objected to evaluate the long-term development of labial gingival recessions during orthodontic treatment and retention phase. Materials and methods. In this retrospective case control study, the presence of gingival recession was scored, yes or no, on plaster models of 100 orthodontic uh, uh, cases and 120 controls at the age of 12. In the treated group, uh, T12 reflected the start of orthodontic treatment, <clears throat> T15 the end of active treatment, and the start of retention phase in bonded retainers. So results, proportion of subjects with recessions was consistently higher in cases than controls. Overall, the odds ratio for orthodontic patients as compared to controls to have recessions was 4.5. So what was the risk factor here? What was the intervention? And what was the outcome? So what's the risk factor? The risk factor, I'm hearing murmuring, somebody has to speak up, is orthodonture. Right? <coughs> they want to see what the risk for recession is in those who have orthodontia versus not when they were young. Right? They follow them for they follow them to see what percentage had recession three whatever three five years later. Right? T12, T15, T18. If this was a case control study, how would it have been conducted? They would have started with the outcome. They would have started with a bunch of kids who had gingival recession and a bunch of kids at age 18 who did not have gingival recession. And they would have gone backwards and seen how many of those who had recession had braces or orthodonture when they were 12. And similarly, in those who didn't have recession, those who had orthodonture when they were 12. That's a case control study. This has a control group, but it's not a case control study. This is a cohort study. They started with a group who were defined at age 12 as having orthodonture and a group who didn't. And they followed them forward, even though it was retrospective. And they, they looked and saw, based on the records, who had different outcomes. So this is, I, I, would, I don't say to the, I find examples like this in medical literature as well. So it's labeled as a case control study. They thought it was a case control study because it had controls. But the case in a case control study is a case of a, of a person with a particular, usually bad outcome, not the case of them getting a treatment and a control being not treatment. That's the definition of a cohort study. So this is a mislabeled study. It's actually a, a typical cohort study where you have people uh, who got the treatment and controls who did not. So it has controls. Cohort studies have controls. It's just not a case control. So it, this is why I say the case control designation is extremely poor language because it seems to imply that if you have a control, you're, it, it, it's natural that people would um, uh, uh, guess that. So I'm not going to go through this last one. So let me just say that the take-home messages here are the strength of evidence provided by the study is found more in its design and conduct than in, in its results, although the, we will talk about the results in the next uh, half of the, the, the morning. Uh, critically assessing the literature means understanding design at a minimum and conduct. And finally, the, dis the, dis the distance from the truth involves considering all these factors. How similar the context is to, and the patients are, to what you're worried about, that's generalizability. Bias, that is, could the, compare, the groups you're comparing be different on factors other than the intervention you're, work, you're worried about? And finally, variability, which is just, you know, how big is the study and how good were the measurements? So I'll stop there and um, ask if there are any questions. <laughs>
They don't have to be. Okay, somebody from the back, breaking the ice. Right. Yeah, that, that's actually a really important point. So that was something I didn't mention, but but should have, which is the other issue with retro. When when we're talking about the the other diff diff difference with retrospective studies that go into the past is the world was different in the past in many ways that we can't measure, and our skills are different, the procedures are different. I mean, there are many things that are different, um, and those are almost never in the medical record. So um, th this is one. You know, that's another huge issue is whether what happened in the past is at all even relevant to today. Um, so thank you for mentioning that. That, that's, that is another automatic thing that you should think about when you look at uh, these you know, studies that based on past medical records. Yeah. Is that basically what you were saying? Yeah. Absolutely right. Yes. In the far, far back. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, literally the hundred million dollar question. Uh, so actually, the, the the partial answer to that is the latest funding announcement from this group called PCORI, which was almost a hundred million dollars to um, encourage groups to get their EHRs to talk to each other. So the problem with the electronic health records, and may or may not be different in dentistry, is that right now, is that one of the per that research was not designated as a, what's called a meaningful use criterion, and this meaningful use is a technical term coming from the federal government uh, for electronic health records. So in many institutions, if not in most, the the electronic health record is just a incredibly sophisticated way of recording what was in the paper notes. You can't even in many systems go into a hospital and say, how many patients did we see here with lymphoma? They are meant to follow a particular patient and facilitate care for that patient. They are literally an electronic version of the paper record. And so because they're not configured for research, definitions of uh, uh, data gathering is not complete. Definitions across different institutions are not consistent. And um, uh, it is enormously complicated to take, for example, the records of Stanford and combine them even for a single disease area with, with the um, records in, say, breast cancer with patients seen across the street in another health network. So making health records digital has enormous potential for improving all of the research that we're talking about, but only if it's actually configured from the get-go for research. So what's going on now is <laughs> a lot of, in a sense, make work, which is what this $100 million is for, is to then now go through a second level abstraction of electronic medical uh, health records and trying to put the information in common formats in some sort of meta database called health information exchanges or data warehouses where you can actually, the information is um, uh, in a common form. Um, and, and we're talking about things as pedestrian as, 
you know, if we're, and I'm sure exact equivalents in dentistry, if you're grading breast cancer, um, the field in one format might be uh, that you grade, the, you have the grade and then you have the stage. So stage two, grade, you know, A, uh, and nodes, plus or minus, all in one field. And in another, you have it in three different fields, grade, stage, nodes. Those don't talk to each other. Somebody has to actually go in there and put those together. So it's, we're not talking, as I might say, rocket science here. It's just that the form of, and the language is not structured. So people use different, you know, like pathologists. It's like chaos. The, the words even different pathologists use to, to describe the same pathology might be different. And once you have them recorded in a digital record, it doesn't make them magically harmonious. So there's huge potential here, but we have literally hundreds of millions of dollars of work that we need to do to, re I don't want to say repair the damage, but to, to, to put electronic health records in a form uh, that actually where the, the research potential is, is realized. But maybe it's different in dem dentistry, maybe you have more consistency of records. I don't know if it's practice by practice or institution by institution or what, but this is something to be watching, watching out for. The more there can be standardization of language um, and you can reflect that in the electronic health record, the better they will do for you going forward. But you had another comment. Okay, so what you're talking, so what that's talking about, I think in the counterpart in, in my world is called a learning healthcare system, where there's constant monitoring and, as you say, feedback of results. And um, that's definitely a dream. It's going on in some places. Uh, it's very, very complex in terms of the systems that you set up uh, and, and also the receptor sites coming back. So it isn't just the case that information, if it's there, it's gonna change practice. You have to have a culture that allows it to change practice. Um, I'm sorry? Oh, well, I, I don't work exactly in that area, but yes, there's um, uh, care systems are incredibly complex. And the thing about learning healthcare systems is that it's not just about knowing which treatment works, but there's a, a very, very long and complicated cascade of making sure the treatment is done a particular way, how the follow-up is, how, you know, whether all sorts of things are delivered at the same time, and it involves engineering the entire care system um, in a hospital that's often very complex. In a dentist's office, maybe it's a little simpler. It, maybe it's just you and the hygienist or, or a follow-up visit or whatever. Uh, I'm sure for many diseases, it's far, far more complex than that. Um, but, but what we're appreciating more and more that, that it's not just the treatments we use, but the entire cascade of care and handoff between multiple providers that determine outcomes. And getting that right is maybe the biggest challenge, I think, in, in the American healthcare system. And we're, we're only at the very beginning of that. We still, you know, the number of people hurt by medical errors um, and uh, is, is still enormous and anybody who's had anybody who sits in a hospital.